the Divine Mercy Chaplet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We will sustain our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. He was not the temptation, but that he was coming. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Father of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole World. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and for those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. 
Today we celebrate the Feast of the Divine Mercy. And on this day, we all have an opportunity to receive an abundance of God's blessings and graces as an outpouring of His mercy for all of us. Those who celebrate this feast would normally draw close to God, to our Lord, who is the font of all mercy, especially by making a holy hour with exposition of our Lord as we are doing today. Also, those who participate in this feast would normally recite the Divine Mercy Chaplet, receive Holy Communion, and go to confession. Because of the coronavirus restrictions, this, as we all know, cannot be done. At least we cannot receive Holy Communion or go to confession. As I mentioned before, if anybody is in a state of mortal sin and they really need to go to confession, they can make an appointment with me and I'd be willing to see them as long as we maintain a good distance between each other. So you are called to make a spiritual communion and to make an act of contrition. Somebody had sent me a video from one of the priests of the Divine Mercy Shrine in the United States and they pointed out that by doing a spiritual communion, making an act of contrition, you can still receive the graces that would flow to us from today's feast. So they referred to the Catechism, and the Catechism it points out that if you have perfect contrition, even if you had mortal sin, your sins would be forgiven, but there is the stipulation that once confession is available, you have to go to confession. And the same would apply to making a spiritual communion. You express your desire to be one with our Lord, to receive Him into your soul, but once the opportunity arises when you can actually receive Him, you have the obligation to do so. As you know, many people are praying for an end to the coronavirus pandemic, something we should all be praying for. We're also praying for all the first responders, for all those who have been struck with, with the virus, for those who have died as a result of having contracted the virus, as well as their family members, their loved ones. And we are also praying for all those who are virus-free, that they stay that way. Those of you who have prayed the Divine Mercy Novena, which began on Good Friday, you would have offered the Divine Mercy Chaplet for specific intentions, a different intention for each day. These specific intentions were given to us by our Lord Himself in His revelations to Saint Faustina. Some of the classes of people prayed for were a great consolation to our Lord. Others were a great cause of concern, concern, sorrow, and suffering for our Lord. The intentions mentioned by our Lord are the following. I just want to quickly run through them. So all mankind, especially sinners, priests and religious, devout and faithful souls, pagans and those who do not yet know Christ, heretics and schismatics, meek and humble souls, as well as little children, those who venerate and glorify God's mercy and truly appreciate the passion of our Lord, those who are suffering in purgatory, those who have become lukewarm and are in danger of perishing. It's good to know that by our faithfulness, by our prayers and devotion, such as the Divine Mercy Chaplet, we can console our Lord and help those who are away from God, who are most in need of God's mercy. Hopefully during this pandemic crisis, people have more time to spend in prayer and to pray for those who need to receive the mercy of God. I've heard different opinions regarding the question, is the present pandemic a chastisement, a punishment from God? Some prominent churchmen have said yes, this pandemic is God's punishment on all mankind. Other prominent churchmen have said, no, this is not caused by God because God is so loving and merciful that he would never cause something like this pandemic to take place. Who is right? And does it really matter? First of all, let me emphasize that it does matter. It matters very much. What we believe about the pandemic and God's role in it will affect our attitude towards God, how we view Him, and how we view ourselves in relation to Him. Regarding the first question, is the pandemic a chastisement from God, yes or no? 
My opinion is that both those who say it is that it is not from God and those who say that it is from God are correct. Allow me to explain. Those who say that God did not cause this virus and the pandemic we are in are right insofar as God did not purposely create or manufacture this virus. As you are probably aware, there seems to be some evidence to suggest that this virus may have inadvertently leaked out of a biolab, a laboratory in which they do experiments on such things. This is certainly a possibility. It is also possible that this virus just came about through natural processes. Animals having the virus somehow transmitted it to humans. I don't believe it does any good to blame this country or that for the spread of this virus. It's not easy to prove. Even if the virus originated in a biolab somewhere, it was not purposely transmitted to the public. It was an accident. Part of the reason I mention this is because my concern is that if too much pressure is placed upon a particular country to take responsibility for this virus and pandemic and to make reparation, this may foment or incite war, especially if major world powers are equally accusing each other of being responsible for this virus. So, just to recap what I have said, I believe they are right who say this virus and pandemic was not directly created by God. It resulted from natural processes or it accidentally leaked out from a bio lab somewhere. I also believe that they are right who say that this virus and pandemic is God's way of punishing or chastising mankind. God did not create this virus, but he did allow it to come into existence and to afflict mankind. Why would God do this? Why would God allow this? Does God want to see us suffer and die? God does not want to see us suffer and die. Understanding this one fact, that God does not want to see us suffer and die, will enable us to understand why God is using the coronavirus to punish or chastise mankind. Too often the problem with many of us is that we easily recognize and are concerned about physical suffering and physical death, but we don't as readily acknowledge spiritual suffering, and we are not as concerned about spiritual death as we should be. Many saints suffered tremendous physical ailments, but were nevertheless quite happy because of their union with God. When one suffers spiritually, however, as in the case of those separated from God, they can never be happy no matter how healthy they may be physically. Whatever happiness they do possess is illusory. It is fleeting. It is just mere worldly happiness. We often think of physical death as being permanent. When a person dies, their soul leaves their body. Their dead body, if not cremated, will disintegrate or turn to dust. And we think that this is permanent. At least it's going to last a very long time. We know and believe that our bodies will be resurrected at the end of time and reunited with our souls. And so in reality, physical death is not permanent, even though we sometimes think that it is. Spiritual death, however, refers to the soul's separation from God, separation from Him who is the source of all life, all goodness, all joy, and all happiness. Basically, it means ending up in hell, being burned by the fires of hell for all eternity, being tormented by the demons of hell for all eternity, being filled with tremendous hatred for everyone, including God and even oneself, and never being able to let go of all that hatred. Spiritual sufferings caused by sin, especially mortal sins, can very easily lead one to spiritual and eternal death in hell. God, out of his tremendous love for us, does not want anyone to suffer spiritually, and he certainly doesn't want anyone to end up in hell. And so God has sent us great preachers or prophets to get us to turn back to him and away from sin. God has also sent us great saint, 
great saints, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Padre Pio, St. John Paul II, St. Teresa of Calcutta, St. Andre Bisset, St. Faustina Kowalska, and we can go on and on. There are so many others so that these saints can be a great inspiration and a great example to all of us in regards to how we ought to live our lives. God has also sent us great intellectuals who have advanced the sciences and have shown through science that the universe has been created out of nothing and that life, even the most primitive life form, could not have developed by chance. In other words, top-notch scientists today are saying there had to be an intelligent designer, a creator who made the world the way that it is and who made us also. It's been pointed out that history tends to repeat itself. Therefore, history is an extremely important teacher to all of us. When we look at the history of the Jewish people, we see that every time they strayed from the ways of God, they brought misery and disaster upon themselves. We could say that God punished or chastised them in order to lead them back to himself. On the other hand, when they were faithful, things went well for them. The same can be said of great pagan nations that became powerful and practiced immorality. Take, for example, the Roman Empire. Many believe that its great corruption, its immorality, its disrespect for human life led to its eventual downfall and collapse. People have not listened to the great preachers or prophets of God. They have not heeded the example and teachings of the great saints. They have not noted the findings of scientists. They have not heeded the lessons of history. It is as if people are content to be without God in their lives. They want to be immoral. They want to be answerable to no one but themselves. They want to be their own God. In addition to all of these sources of information, all these warnings, we also have the words of scripture. In St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 1 to 5, we have the following. There were some present at that very time who told him, our Lord, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered thus? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Part of what Christ is telling us here is that unless we repent, unless we turn away from sin and turn back to God and to the ways of God, we are in danger of perishing. Perishing not only spiritually, but also physically. By our sinfulness, by our lack of faithfulness to God, we bring misery and disaster upon ourselves. We can also refer to this as a punishment or a chastisement of God. As our Lord points out, those who perished were not greater sinners than others. In other words, when, when these deadly when there are these deadly accidents or deadly scourges upon mankind, both the bad and the good will be victims. What is implied, however, is that if we repent and turn back to God, then we will not perish, we will not be struck down, or will be less likely to, to be struck down. We, God will not punish or chastise sinful mankind. The book of Revelation also makes clear that when mankind is struck by various types of calamities, the intended result ought to be the repentance of men. Chapter 20, verse 9 of the book of Revelation states, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshipping demons and idols of silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot either see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their immorality, or their thefts. Because they did not give up these abominations, more scourges were to come upon all of them, upon all of mankind.
In addition to all of these, God tried to warn mankind in 1917 through the apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Fatima and, and, and the miracle of the sun, which took place on October the 13th, 1917, and was, with, and was witnessed by 70,000 people, including many atheists and newspaper reporters. God wanted to get the attention of the entire world by this amazingly huge miracle, the sun spinning in the sky, throwing off different colors of streams of light and then appearing, appearing to fall towards the earth. People thought it was going to be the end of the world. They thought they were going to die. But then the sun went back to its place in the sky. This was reported all over the world. This was big news and still should be big news. Perhaps it would be good for all of us to review the events and the revelations of Our Lady of Fatima. One of the things that the Blessed Virgin at Fatima made very clear is that if people do not stop offending God, there will be another world war to punish mankind. Mankind brought that war, the Second World War, upon itself, but God used that war as a punishment, a chastisement, so that mankind would stop sinning and turn back to God. In other words, Mankind did not listen to the great prophets or to the saints or to the scientific evidence for God's existence or to the lessons of history or to scripture or even to miraculous apparitions. And so God had no choice but to inflict hardships and suffering on mankind so that at least some might turn back to him and be saved. Think of it this way. Would a loving parent, aware that his or her child is doing things that are very detrimental to the child's well-being, let's say doing drugs or, or something like that, would a, would a parent, a loving parent, just turn a blind eye and allow their child to harm themselves in this way? Would the parent try to speak to the child, try, try every means possible to convince the child to stop this bad behavior? Of course the parent would do this. If the child still refuses to listen, would a loving parent not impose restrictions or some form of punishment to try to get the child to listen and to obey? This is what a loving parent does. And this is what God does when we fail to heed his message of repentance. Our focus today on the Feast of Divine Mercy is the mercy of God, his tremendous generosity in forgiving us when we turn to him with sorrow for our sins. God does not desire the death of the sinner, but his repentance. God, is not, God does not want to see us end up in hell. He wants us to turn to him so that he can save us. If mankind refuses to listen to God, in all the different ways that God is trying to communicate to us. There's nothing left for God to do but to chastise us. Perhaps then many will wake up. Perhaps then many will repent and turn back to God and save their souls from going to hell. This necessity of punishing or chastising mankind is actually alluded to in, in the Divine Mercy messages to St. Faustina. It is actually the occasion for St. Faustina to receive the prayers of the, of the chaplet, which really refer to the sacrifice of Calvary, which is the same as the sacrifice of the Mass, which is the source of all of God's blessings for us and his tremendous love and mercy for all of us. I wanted to read to you from the diary of St. Faustina. Uh, it's number 474 and 475. In the evening, when I was in my cell, I saw an angel, the executor of divine wrath. He was clothed in a dazzling robe, his face gloriously bright, a cloud beneath his feet. From the cloud, bolts of thunder and flashes of lightning were springing into his hands, and from his hand they were going forth, and only then were they striking the earth. When I saw this sign of divine wrath, which was about to strike the earth, and in particular a certain place, which for good reasons I cannot name, I began to implore the angel to hold off for a moment, for, for a few moments, and the world would do penance. But my plea was a mere nothing in the face of the divine anger. Just then I saw the Most Holy Trinity. The greatness of its majesty pierced me deeply, and I did not dare to repeat my entreaties. 
At that very moment, I felt in my soul the power of Jesus' grace, which dwells in my soul. When I became conscious of this grace, I was instantly snatched up before the throne of God. Oh, how great is our Lord and God, and how incomp incomprehensible his holiness. I will make no attempt to describe this greatness, because before long we shall all see him as he is. I found myself pleading with God for the world with words heard interiorly. As I was praying in this manner, I saw the angel's helplessness. He could not carry out the just punishment which was rightly due for sins. Never before had I prayed with such inner power as I did then. The words with which I entreated God are these, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for our sins and those of the whole world. St. Faustina's pleading with God, and in particular by the prayer that was revealed to her, which is a reference to the sacrifice of Calvary and to the Mass, by doing this she was able to avert the just punishment of mankind, the chastisement of mankind. But for how long? Our prayers, too, can help avert the miseries that mankind is bringing upon itself. But for how long? Many want the coronavirus restrictions to be over so that we can go back to normal. As many people have pointed out, we can never go back to how things were. There will be a new normal. More people will be wearing masks. Flights will be more restricted. There will be periodic testings. People will have to get va vaccine inject injections and so on and so on. Note that no one mentions the fact that we should not go back to the way we were in regards to sin. In other words, we should not go back to a sinful lifestyle. No one mentions that we need to give up sin, that we need to be more faithful to God. Yes, I know religious people mention it, but no one in the world seems to be concerned about this. In other words, are we going to go back to the same atheistic, materialistic, hedonistic, self-centered mode of life that many people are living, or the majority of people are living today, or at least prior to the outbreak of the coronavirus? I know I am preaching to the converted, so the problem isn't necessarily with you or with me. The problem is that mankind has turned away from God, and it is only you and I who can help them to return to God. I think blame falls especially on the leaders of the church. We have not done enough to educate our faithful. We have not warned the faithful about sin and the sinful practices in society that have become commonplace and acceptable norms and and the, the sins that our children are being indoctrinated with and may, being made to believe that are okay. We have not taught the faith clearly enough to equip you to be able to convert others and to lead them to Christ. We have not inspired you enough so that you would be filled with zeal and want to spread your faith and to help, to help save souls. Our Lord revealed to St. Faustina that this is the time of mercy. But he also revealed that this time is going to run out eventually. This is the time when we can still turn back to God. This is the time when sinners can still turn back to God and be forgiven. But the time will run out. And for many, it is running out right now. Many are dying. Eventually, all of us are going to die for, for one reason or another we will have to face the justice of God. Our chance to have our sins forgiven will be over and gone. Punishment, chastisement, is really a form of God's mercy. Not to say that every time there is a pandemic or a natural catastrophe that God is punishing us, but when we do stray from God, we do bring more and more misery and disaster upon ourselves. I wanted to draw your attention to the parable of the prodigal son. This parable, I believe, kind of summarizes what I wanted to emphasize regarding 
the love of God, but also how God chastises us for our sins. If you recall in the parable of the prodigal son, the younger son asked for his share of the inheritance from his father. And by doing this, he's definitely offending his father. It's as if he's wishing his father were dead. So he wants to be his own master. He doesn't want to be answerable to his father. So he goes off to a distant land where he can do whatever he wants. It's the same with mankind today. Many wish that God and religion were dead. They want to be their own God. They want to be their own ruler. They want to do, be able to do their own thing. They want to be answerable to themselves. They don't want anybody telling them that something is immoral or wrong. The younger son, as we know, goes away and he squanders his property on dissolute living, including on prostitutes. And he ends up with nothing. Everything he had is gone. He lost everything. And a severe famine afflicts, afflicts the land. He doesn't mention it, but he probably doesn't really have a proper home to stay in. His clothes are probably tattered and dirty. He has no place to get new clothes or to have a change of clothing. And we know that he is starving. He's so desperate that he hires himself, himself out to watch over a herd of pigs. And he realizes the pigs are better off than he is because at least they have something to eat. Now, all of these terrible things that happen to him, the famine, no home, running out of money, the fact that he's starving, his humiliation, all of these we could say is part of God's providence or his chastisement to bring him low and to make him turn to God. It mentions in the parable that eventually he comes to himself himself in other words he comes to his senses and he realizes that his father's hired hands have plenty to eat so he decides to go home and he will say to his father father i have sinned against heaven and, and before you i am not worthy to be called your son treat me as one of your hired servants and so he sets off to go home and what happens the father sees him coming rushes out to meet him embraces him puts the the, the robe on him the the ring on his finger he kills the fatted calf and basically he has a celebration. In other words, God is lavishing his love upon him, manifesting his mercy, his forgiveness upon him. And this is the lesson we ought to take for ourselves. Mankind has strayed from God just as the younger son in this parable. But we must come to our senses. Mankind must come to its senses and come back to God because if we don't it won't just be the coronavirus pandemic that we have to face it will be economic collapse possible war natural catastrophes and we can go on and on and on let us take advantage of God's mercy while we still have the time while we still can but let us also do what we can to spread the message of God's mercy to those who are desperately in need of receiving it.
You have given them bread from heaven, alleluia, alleluia. Call the gates of all the city, alleluia, alleluia. Let us pray. O God, we possess a lasting memorial of your passion in this wondrous sacrament. Grant that we may so venerate the mysteries of your body and blood, that we may always feel within ourselves the effects of your redemption. You who live and reign forever and ever. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be His sacred heart. Blessed be His sacred heart. Blessed be His precious blood. Blessed be His precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Consoler. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Consoler. Blessed be the Mother of God, Holy Mary. Blessed be the Most Holy Mary, Mother of God. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her Most Holy and Immaculate Conception. Blessed be her Glorious Assumption. Blessed be her Glorious Assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in His angels and in His saints. Blessed be God in His angels and in His saints. Oh. 